Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Richard Carlton, CEO of the Canadian Securities Exchange, the Exchange for Entrepreneurs, their website, the CSE.com. He's speaking to us from Toronto. Welcome to This Week in Money. Thank you very much, Jim. Now, Canada's junior capital markets have been in trouble for quite some time. People are looking for solutions to some of the problems. The Venture Exchange recently held a town hall type meeting in Vancouver to talk about the exchange. It was a pretty boisterous crowd, by the way, and told the regulars, regulators, hey, look, uh, we need help here. Are the regulators listening? And are they really going to make any difference? It's uh, an interesting question because uh, I think the uh, regulators see themselves as being uh, somewhat conflicted in that they've got twin mandates of promoting investor protection, but also creating the conditions for fair and efficient uh, capital market operations. And I don't think anybody who's been involved in the development of the junior capital markets over the last few years would argue that uh, um, the uh, key uh, objective for the regulators uh, recently has been more on the investor protection side. And uh, we see that uh, in a whole range of measures that have been introduced, which, uh, you know, to be blunt, uh, have significantly increased the cost of operation for a number of dealers, as well as uh, increased uh, considerably their civil liability exposure in just conducting their uh, their traditional business lines. Are independent brokerage houses in big trouble? We just saw a Globe and Mail article that said that independent houses were on the way down. How important is the survival of independent brokerage houses to the CSE? Well, they're very important. Um, I think there's, again, no doubt that uh, raising money for early stage enterprise in Canada is a very challenging exercise at the moment. And whenever you see an important channel of uh, finance for these companies, uh, you know, in trouble, uh, as I think it's, uh, again, abundantly clear that the independent uh, brokerage firms in Canada are, then um, that's just going to simply make it more difficult for entrepreneurs of all stripes uh, to raise the growth capital that they need to uh, to build their business. Um, I think, you know, if you want to talk about what the underlying reasons are, uh, I would go back to my former comment that uh, I think well-intentioned uh, regulation um from the, uh, you know, both, both from IROC and from the Canadian Securities Administrators, really has had a direct impact on the cost of operation. Um, if you look at measures such as the customer relationship uh, model, uh, changes uh, to the uh, know your client rules, and uh, uh, the potential implementation of uh, essentially civil liability for uh, fiduciary responsibilities uh, for the dealers, it has uh, had a significant increase uh, in the cost of operations for all brokers. The problem being that the smaller independent Canadian dealers just simply don't have the scale uh, to be able to absorb these new costs, the same as uh, you know their their colleagues uh, who work for bank-owned firms or international firms that have operations uh, in Canada. So there's no doubt uh, that uh, when you combine uh, the situation with the difficult market conditions, the uh, lack of uh, uh, of mandates from the uh, various indus- traditional Canadian industries uh, for uh, corporate finance and uh, mergers and acquisitions advice, the challenges that their investment advisors have in recommending uh, client investments uh, in early stage uh, uh, capital market stories, uh, it, it presents a very bleak landscape uh, for uh, management and uh, employees. Uh, at Canada's uh, independent brokerage firms. What are the reasons behind the independent brokerage houses closing? Is it increased regulation, additional costs, things like that? Well, I mean, I think uh, I talked a little bit about all of those things yep. uh, in my previous comments. The uh, Again, uh, all brokers uh, are under these same pressures, but they fall particularly hard on the independent dealers who just don't have the scale uh, to absorb the enhanced administrative costs, and when you, as I say, combine that uh, with the uh, constraints on their revenue side because of, again, very, very slow activity in terms of IPOs and and, uh, and capital raising in the natural resource space, and, uh, you know, as well as uh, the challenges they have in uh, providing uh, financing uh, and earning commissions on, you know, sale of shares to their clients. 
um, it does, as I say, paint a very uh, challenging picture uh, for, for those independent brokerage firms. Can the junior stock exchanges in Canada survive without independent brokerage houses? Well, I suspect that we will um, because uh, I think, as you're aware, uh, there is a substantial uh, non-dealer um, uh, ecosystem for uh, capital market formation. Um, typically, the uh, exempt market dealers, or the EMDs, uh, which are active uh, across the country, have uh, uh, stepped up to uh, fill at least part of the financing gap for uh, early-stage entrepreneurs. But uh, certainly, as I mentioned at the outset, um, you know, the dealers provide an extremely important uh, gatekeeping and advisory role for clients and for entrepreneurs, and uh, the system will be uh, substantially less robust and effective um, if, uh, you know, we do in fact lose um, a significant portion of the independent uh, uh, dealers in Canada. Now, of course, we know where there's crisis, there's also opportunity. Do you think we might see new junior stock exchanges being created in Canada if the uh, venture exchange stumbles and falls. Well, <laughs> we're we're in fact a new stock exchange uh, that was uh, formed. I, I I don't necessarily want to say that it was as a result of our uh, competitor uh, stumbling or falling, but uh, we certainly saw an opportunity back uh, 11, 12, 13 years ago now to provide stock exchange services that uh, used uh, or relied more on uh, things like the internet uh, to ensure that uh, uh, interested uh, potential investors and companies had access to all of their uh, the disclosure record um, and all of their regulatory filings and news releases and of course the chat rooms and the bull you know the bull boards and and all of that sort of thing in order to make their investment decision um, we specifically designed our rules uh, to emphasize disclosure um, over uh, having the exchange itself conduct a lengthy and detailed and expensive uh, business merit review. That is the approach taken by some other exchanges uh, active in Canada. And uh, with that approach, uh, we believe that we are able to deliver a much quicker turnaround um, in, uh, you know, from the time that the company applies to list on our exchange and, uh, you know, when they in fact uh, do list. Uh, that higher degree of certainty, uh, the companies tell us, uh, makes it easier for them to uh, raise money because uh, when they commit uh, or when they raise money that's uh, committed uh, on a contingent basis, contingent with listing, the, uh, they know that the listing, in fact, is, uh, is relatively imminent, provided that they're, again, fully up to date in terms of their audited financials and uh, disclosure record. So our objective is to deliver the lowest cost of public capital that uh, is available for uh, early stage company entrepreneurs uh, here in Canada. We're speaking with Canadian Securities Exchange CEO Richard Carlton. Is the mandate of the CSC in dealing with listed companies to ensure that all full and plain disclosure is provided and or to pass judgment on deals? Well, any exchange uh, in Canada uh, requires that full, true, and plain disclosure has been provided uh, to the marketplace in some way, shape, or form uh, prior to the company listing. And that can be achieved uh, through some form of uh, prospectus, whether it's an offering prospectus or a non-offering prospectus. And increasingly, uh, what you see uh, are people using, of course, prospectus-exempt uh, means, uh, the offering memorandum, uh, which uh, is almost uh, nationally accept, uh, available at this point. Uh, I think Ontario just joined the uh, uh, the rest of Canada in the, in the last couple of weeks, is uh, one means uh, for a company to uh, provide uh, full, true, and plain disclosure to the marketplace without going through a prospectus uh, process. And there's also the obligation uh, of uh, every company upon listing to provide a listing statement um, if they haven't done a prospectus, uh, which uh, in fact stands uh, in, in as the full, true, and plain disclosure. Uh, it's intended to provide prospectus-level disclosure uh, to the marketplace uh, uh, prior to listing. Would the CSE benefit from running a single platform with the ability to police shorting and front-running? Well, the shorting and front-running question uh, comes up a lot. 
Um, the markets across Canada are regulated by the Investment Industry Regulatory Organization of Canada, or IROC, and uh, they are responsible for administering all of the trading rules and policies, uh, whether you are uh, trading on the Canadian Securities Exchange, the TSX Venture Exchange, the Toronto Stock Exchange, Equitas, or any of the other uh, alternative trading systems that are in place. So it's not actually in our regulatory jurisdiction or our bailiwick to be able to implement different short sale rules or principles around manipulative or deceptive trading uh, than are in place on, on the other platforms. That's, that's the job of IROC. Uh, across all of the trading platforms uh, in Canada. How much time and money is required to list a new or existing public company on the CSE? Well, that depends. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the goal, as I mentioned earlier, is to deliver the lowest cost of, of public capital uh, in, in, in Canada. Um, as I mentioned, the key advantage that we offer uh, over and above the fact that uh, uh, our fees you know, are very, very competitive. And they're also flat rate and predictable. Uh, so that, uh, we charge companies, uh, $500 a month, uh, once they're listed. We don't charge them additional fees, uh, to change their capital structure, to change their board, to change their management team, to issue press releases. Or most importantly, we don't charge them fees to raise additional funds. Um, other exchanges operating in Canada, uh, charge, uh, listed companies for all of those things so that when you add it up um, the fees that the companies are paying to us are very competitive with their alternatives um, uh, in in Canada but frankly more importantly than that the uh, I mentioned that uh, given the nature of our listings rules and uh, policies it tends to be a shorter time period uh, from uh, the listing application to the actual date of listing that tends to mean that uh, your lawyers are charging you less because they're spending you less time on the file. Your accountants are charging you less because they are spending less time on the file. And other advisors, knowing that uh, it will be um, a, a shorter time period, perhaps, than they're, uh, uh, than they're used to, um, are prepared to uh, allow for that in, in the fees that they charge. So when you put together the entire package, as I say, it's a very, very compelling proposition uh, for a potential public company to list on the Canadian Securities Exchange. Now, some junior companies are upset with minimum board tr- lots being sold below the previous trade and the last hour of trading in their stocks, trading under $0.10, cents, even under $0.05. Cents. Could these trades, some of them for $25, $50, bucks, be a form of manipulation? Uh, it's certainly possible. Um and, uh, you know, it is obviously something that's a, a real concern for companies. And, you know, again, I, during the last century, worked at the Toronto Stock Exchange, and I can assure you there were concerns at that point that uh, uh, transactions that were printed uh, near the close uh, of the market, especially at the end of the quarter and the end of the year, uh, you know, may have been done for the purposes of uh, uh uh, manipulating may be a strong word, but uh, shall we say influencing the overall market capitalization of the issuer involved. Um, and that becomes a, a particular concern, uh, as you point out, uh, when you have companies with a relatively small market cap that trade uh, in uh, you know the five to ten cent range. Um, clearly, uh, it's something that the regulators uh, do look at and and watch out for. Um, and there are, as I say, I, I can assure you, plenty of rules uh, in the Universal Market Integrity Rules, which IROC administers, to uh, control uh, manipulative and deceptive uh, trading practices. And um, you know, so so you know, the the regulators are watching. Um, but that said, uh, it's it's always a concern when a relatively small amount of money can uh, influence uh, the uh, overall market capitalization of the uh, of the issuer. Any chance the CSE will increase the board lot size for stocks trading under ten cents? Um, again, I you know don't want to be deferring all of these things to IROC, but the um, the board lot size is uh, actually 
uh, set out in the uh, IROC trading rules, the humor that I referred to earlier. It is something that uh, we're we're looking at and potentially prepared to advocate uh, for uh, with the uh, with the folks at IROC. The one concern uh, on the other side of the ledger uh, would be that that would dramatically increase the uh, number of odd lots uh, that uh, people are uh, holding. You know, so that the existing shareholders who have for example, less than 10,000 shares of a particular issuer would wind up holding odd lots. Um, odd lots themselves uh, can trade away from the uh, national best bid, best offer. Um, and uh, so they receive no price protection or no, um, um, uh, you know, again, they, they could theoretically trade it at any price. Um, so that could lead to a number of issues, so we'd have to look at that carefully. But increasing the board lot size uh, would increase the uh, financial risk associated with, um, uh, you know, trying to influence the overall market capitalization uh, of company um, with a board lot executed, uh, you know, near the close of trading for a day. Shorting and the uptick rule are under the jurisdiction of IROC. There are approximately 13 trading platforms in Canada right now. Now, if each platform had to separately abide by a reinstated uptick rule, for all of its trading, no matter what the platform, do you think naked shorting would be a thing of the past? Well, the I'm been around the industry long enough to remember when there, you know, was an uptick rule, uh, and it was in fact administered across the various trading platforms uh, that we had in place. So it's it's certainly possible uh, to uh, to implement it. I'm uh, where where I'm at on the issue. Is that uh, you know we we I'm not confident that uh, IROC has uh, properly or deeply enough considered uh, the issues of the uh, of short selling in the uh, junior capital space. Um, the studies that uh, IROC has uh, looked at um, in uh, uh, implementing the uh, abolition of the, uh, of the of the tick test for short sales, generally speaking. Uh, or in fact almost universally at this point, looks at large cap stocks. And I think it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's beyond uh, argument at this point that uh, uh, restricting short sales in the large capitalization uh, stocks actually does restrict liquidity, it widens spreads, it decreases volume. So, as I say, when you're talking about a, a bank stock or a large energy company or so on, we would not be in favor of uh, restricting uh, short sales uh, in the manner that is suggested. I think we really do need to take a hard look at what's going on in the junior capital market. Uh, I think the fact that uh, you've got so much stress, uh, particularly in the natural resources uh, space, uh, the stocks are trading you know, for less than 10 cents in many cases, and the companies themselves are desperately trying to keep their stock price above 5 cents in order to uh, facilitate um, you know, capital raising. Um, and I think that it is, in fact, possible uh, for people to make substantial profits, trading profits, uh, by shorting stocks uh, in that uh, price range and uh, doing so with relatively little risk. Now, as I say, I know that the view is held almost universally amongst the dealers and uh, the companies in the uh, junior capital space that, that this is, in fact, going on. If it is, uh, it ought to be abundantly clear uh, to IROC who see everything, right? They have very sophisticated uh, uh, programs uh, which uh, oversee trading activity. And with the uh, audit trail that we have in place in Canada, uh, they know the identity of every individual who submitted the order uh, that shows up in the system. So any pattern of trading, any pattern of conduct um, you know, with, with with respect to say stocks uh, trading for less than twenty cents, uh, would be immediately clear uh, to anybody uh, uh, researching the point. The problem is, I just I have not seen uh, any research that has in fact focused on that uh, area of the market specifically. So uh, we certainly advocate for you know research, and if the anecdotal evidence is true. We'd certainly be prepared to uh, advocate for a reinstitution, maybe not of the the, the former tech test, uh, but we've got some ideas uh, around uh, 
ways to uh, uh, put uh, some roadblocks in the way of uh, short selling uh, that uh, I think would be easier to administer and to implement. It seems to be getting tougher to take part in a private placement due to all the regulations that deny people the opportunity. Unless they meet a lot of criteria, they can't be over 65 and so on. I've heard even billionaires have been turned down the opportunity to invest because of their age. If the accredited investor requirements and client relationships management were replaced with a standardized form, say just a page or two, would that help investment in the CSE? You know, this is, uh, again, the great conflict that the uh, regulators have uh, presented us with because on the one hand, uh, there there's, seems to be a, again, a very well-meaning uh, but perhaps ill-considered focus on investor protection and in their activities. And, uh, uh, you know, not only have we seen, uh, we talked a little bit about uh, uh, the, the constraints that the dealers have been put under, and now these, uh, you know, prospectus-exempt uh, private placements, which are often done by exempt market dealers, uh, also seem to be under significant pressure uh, from the regulators uh, by way of uh, increased regulation, documentation, and other requirements. But then at the same time, uh, we've got the regulators that are promoting uh, crowdfunding in its uh, various forms across the country uh, as a means of uh, encouraging people to invest in early-stage capital stories and startups and, and, and so on. And I find it personally impossible to reconcile uh, two directions. That on, on the one hand, we've got an extremely well-respected infrastructure of dealers and exempt market dealers in Canada who are, you know, and I'm not exaggerating, renowned around the world for their ability to raise money for pre-revenue and early-stage uh, business stories who, you know, are being subjected to ever more stringent uh, uh, regulation. And at the same time, uh, we've got... Uh, the regulators uh, now articulating rules uh, to provide for uh, crowdfunding. Uh, as I mentioned, one of the problems is that we've got, I think, five different crowdfunding rules in Canada at this point. But, you know, where there are relatively uh, limited protections uh, beyond uh, limits on the amount that uh, an individual could invest uh, for for people looking to put money into these, uh, into these businesses. So, Again, I, I think that there needs to be a significant reconciliation of the policies around this that, in fact, uh, provide for a, a single track where, you know, registrants of various kinds, uh, whether they're full-blown IROC dealers or exempt market dealers, can, in fact, use the principles underlying the crowdfunding um, uh, means of uh, capital raising to uh, basically reduce their costs and increase their client base and uh, effectively sell securities over the Internet. I, I don't see why we shouldn't be allowing uh, those people to uh, undertake those uh, those activities. If Vancouver is still the junior mining capital of the world, could the CSC benefit by moving the head office to Vancouver? <laughs> <laughs> I was afraid you were going to ask me that. Yeah, um, We've actually had an office in Vancouver of uh, since inception, basically, of the organization. And, uh, in fact, our head of listing sales uh, is uh, based in Vancouver. Uh, I work out of the Vancouver office uh, regularly, and, uh, in fact, I, I look forward to it, um, especially at this time of the year when uh, uh, Bay Street uh, can be a bit of a drafty, uh, cold uh, canyon. But uh, uh, and, and in fact, about 50% of the companies uh, listed on the Canadian Securities Exchange are in fact uh, domiciled in uh, British Columbia. But that said, uh, we also have uh, important uh, client base in in Alberta, uh, in Ontario, and in Quebec, and from the United States, and from Asia, and from Europe, and so on. Um, so you know, I, I think it actually doesn't really matter uh, where we're headquartered um, for a bunch of reasons. Our Trading technology probably has to be in Toronto, um, but uh, as I say, we, uh, we we cover the Vancouver market and British Columbia generally uh, quite well, and I certainly enjoy uh, every opportunity I get to come to British Columbia. Just how proactive is the CSE in finding solutions to all these issues and problems? Well, I mean, as for us, it is the lifeblood. Um, we 
have to ensure uh, that prospective public companies can can raise money, because if they can't, then there's frankly no reason for our existence. And a a breakdown uh, in the system for uh, finding growth capital for for entrepreneurs would, you know, for us, uh, you know, really, uh, you know, th- th- there would be no reason uh, for us to exist if, if that were to uh, that were to cease. And uh, you know, again, if you want to think about or look at um, you know what what it what it looks like. Uh, just look at the United States. Um, you know there is really no public early stage capital market anymore. Uh, you know people sort of still think of Nasdaq as is that place, but it hasn't been that place uh, for more than a generation. Um, you know the public markets in the United States now, uh, New York Stock Exchange and and Nasdaq in particular, they are exits. For private equity and venture capital and high net worth individuals who have invested in the the Facebooks and the LinkedIn's and the Instagrams and so on, uh, it's it's a liquidity event. It's an opportunity for them to get their money out. Um, it's not where companies go to to raise money in order to finish the product, to hire employees, to lease space, to uh, hire a sales team, or you know all of the things that companies need to do uh, in their first uh, year of existence. So the U.S. Uh, has filled that gap, generally speaking, through private investment uh, and private investment that's uh, really only open to uh, institutions and to um, wealthy individuals. Uh, we think that's wrong. Uh, we think that there's a hugely important role for individual investors to profit in the growth of the Canadian economy uh, and to help support uh, the entrepreneurial spirit of uh, individuals that uh, uh, increase employment and uh, overall create wealth uh, for the country, and uh, we'd think it would uh, Canada would be a much poorer place uh, if we did not uh, continue to support uh, the continued vitality of our public market. Do you think more companies will be attracted to the CSC if it takes the lead in finding solutions facing the junior markets? Um, I think certainly if we're viewed as an opinion leader uh, in the space, um, it uh, it can't hurt. But ultimately, uh, it comes down to uh, how much money can I raise and, and what is the cost? And uh, if we happen to be, as we hope to be and intend to be, the place where uh, people can do it uh, at the uh, most effective, most cost-effective uh, uh, rate, then uh, they will continue to uh, support uh, support our exchange. What do you think people can do to help get the regulators and so on to make the changes that will make the Canadian junior markets more profitable? They need to be participating in the conversation, um, and there is ample opportunity to do it. The Securities Commissions uh, regularly put rules and policies and so out, out for public comment. Uh, it's available on all their websites and you'll see news releases and so on. You don't have to go very far to, uh, to, to find out. You should be part of the conversation. Similarly, IROC, uh, they have a public mandate. They periodically issue a number of, uh, rules and policies, uh, for, for public comment. Um, they, uh, can and do respond, uh, to, uh, uh, to positions that are taken by, you know, not not just the exchanges and the broker dealers and the law firms, but from individual investors. So, as I say, I, I can't encourage people strongly enough to become part of the conversation. How can people find out more about the Canadian Securities Exchange? Well, the most obvious place is uh, our website at uh, www.thecsc.com, and uh, if they hold off for a few more weeks, uh, they'll see a completely revamped, uh, much more feature-rich site uh, under that that banner. But uh, we obviously encourage uh, um, your listeners uh, and uh, investors uh, across Canada to to come and have a look. Richard, thank you very much for talking to This Week in Money. My pleasure again. Thank you. My guest has been Richard Carlton, CEO of the Canadian Securities Exchange, their website, the CSE.com. And that wraps up our show for this week. Comments or questions for the show can be emailed to info at HowStreet.com. 
I'm Jim Goddard. We're back next week with more This Week in Money. This Week in Money is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.